Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly briefing. This week, we will hear, as always, from Public Health Madison Dane County. We'll also hear from our forestry department and our water utility. And then I, of course, have a number of things to talk about as well. Uh, so we'll start with Janelle Heinrich, who's the director of Public Health Madison Dane County, and go from there. Good morning. As I usually do, I'll start with some data. As of today, we have had 37,600 individuals diagnosed with COVID-19 since this pandemic started in Dane County. Our 14-day average is 134.5 cases per day, which is down from 181.3 last week. Since December 1st, we have lost 116 people in Dane County from COVID-19. Hospitalizations have stabilized but remain high, and right now there are 89 people hospitalized with COVID in Dane County. This week represents almost a year of living with COVID-19 here in our community. It has been an incredibly challenging year for all of us, personally, professionally, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And we know so much more today than we did a year ago. And we are continuing to learn about this illness and how to live with it while also keeping it at bay and our eyes open for new challenges we may face as this pandemic continues to evolve. But we must continue to have hope. We're at this place today where we have as many people vaccinated against COVID in Dane County as we've had people who have tested positive. It took a year for approximately 37,600 people to test positive for COVID. In just one month, 38,660 Dane County residents have been immunized with at least one dose of vaccine. While we'd all like vaccination to go faster, the fact that 7.1% of our population and nearly 10% of Dane County residents 65 years and older have, released, have received at least one dose of vaccine in just a month of having the vaccine available is amazing and should be celebrated. All the vaccinators in Dane County are ready to pick up the pace of vaccination as soon as the supply chain increases. Until then, and even for a little while after, the best thing our community can do is to continue to wear masks and limit contact with others. While we are incredibly enthusiastic about how many people have been vaccinated already, the possibility of new, more infectious variants of the virus making their way to our community is a concern. And finally, I want to encourage you to get the vaccine as soon as you are eligible. These groundbreaking COVID-19 vaccines are safe and extremely effective. While the process to create the vaccines was fast, no safety steps were skipped, it's normal to feel some hesitancy about a new vaccine, but every study, every trial, and every phase was reviewed and approved by the FDA and a safety board. Tens of thousands of people participated in vaccine trials to assure they are safe and effective, and the vaccine has since been given to millions of people safely. At 95% efficacy, this vaccine is extraordinarily effective at protecting you from the virus. You can find more information about the COVID vaccine on our website at publichealthmdc.com slash coronavirus slash COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you and stay well. Thank you, Janelle. Next, we will hear from Craig Klinke from Forestry with an update on our emerald ash borer work and other forestry-related things. <clears throat> Thank you. Aside from the obvious reasons, 2020 brought three major changes to Madison Forestry. Number one. APM 6-2 was changed. This is the APM that mandates how we notify the public regarding tree pruning and removal operations. 
We used to have to hand post a door hanger at every house that had trees in front in need of pruning. <clears throat> Obviously, this was a time consuming process. Now we're able to inform the public electronically via a map located on our webpage and through all their notifications that pruning activities will be taking place. This change saved, saved hundreds of hours of work alone in 2020. Number two, the five-year project of preemptively removing ash trees due to emerald ash borer, or EAB, was completed in 2019. Over the course of five years, we removed over 10,500 ash trees. On average, we spent about 6,400 hours per year removing the trees. 2020 was the first year since the onset of EAB that we were able to use these resources for other purposes. Finally, the third significant change for us in 2020 was forestry moving from the Parks Division to the Streets Division. This move made operational sense because prior to the move, streets and forestry were already assisting each other. Streets was grubbing all of our stumps. Streets was loaning us equipment, such as clam, tru clam trucks, brush trucks, and vascovators. And forestry was providing plow trucks and drivers to streets during snow events. Moving from the Parks Division to the Streets Division only increased these efficiencies. Streets and forestry are now able to work even closer together and support each other more effectively on an almost daily basis. Streets helps forestry with tree work and forestry supports streets in snow removal efforts. We wish to recognize the mayor on her foresight for implementing the changes to APM 6-2 and for recognizing the efficiencies gained by moving from the Parks Division to the Streets Division. Thank you for your support. The early results of these actions is extremely promising. <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment to talk about some of the highlights of the year that were made possible because of the previously mentioned changes in leadership. <clears throat> For reference, I used data from 2020 and compared it to the five-year averages during the years we were working on preemptive ash removals, 2015 through 2019. One way to measure the progress of a municipal forestry program is to analyze how long it takes in between each round of pruning. This is what we call a pruning cycle. <clears throat> One of the goals recognized by the Urban Forestry Task Force is for us to reduce our pruning cycle. Madison Forestry has two cycle pruning programs, small tree pruning and what we call all tree pruning. Small tree pruning involves what we, uh, what we can do typically from the ground on trees that are about planted up to about nine years of age. All tree pruning means just what it says. We prune every single tree within the identified geographic district. The average number of small trees pruned during the EAB years was 4,400. In 2020, we pruned over 11,000 small trees. This is an increase of over 6,650 trees. The average number of district trees pruned during the EAB years was 2,400. In 2020, we pruned 5,700. Again, another significant increase in, in numbers. In this case, 3,300 additional trees were pruned. Cycle pruning is not only important for tree health and structure, but a healthy pruning cycle will also decrease the amount of damage from storms. Granted, we're only one year in, and we didn't have any major storm events last year. However, the amount of time we spent responding to storm work decreased by 39%. This number may go up or down over the next few years, depending upon the severity of storms. However, this is a trend that will continue to get better and better over time as our pruning cycle continues to decrease. Another critical component of our program is planting trees. Another goal recommended by the Urban Forestry Task Force is to increase tree canopy. The number of trees planted in 2020 was consistent with the number planted the last few years. The number is fairly high due to the fact that we have to replant to replace ash trees. On average, we've been planting around 2,500 trees per year. However, the big change to note in 2020 is that we had streets to perform all the utility locating work. This allowed us to mechanically auger more planting sites and to hand dig fewer. In turn, this allowed us to plant more trees per day. So, even though planting numbers stayed the same, the amount of time it took us to plant went down significantly, even though we had to overcome all the social distancing requirements to keep our staff safe. 
Overall, planting was sped up by 850 hours. Now, just because we're finished completing preemptive removals doesn't mean that we're finished dealing with EAB. Madison has 11,000 ash trees remaining in the right-of-way, and every one of these trees is treated once every three years to prevent EAB infestation. This is a significant project that does not have an end date in sight. Last year, we switched to a new formulation of product that is more concentrated and less viscous. The trees were able to translocate this formulation much more quickly than the previous material. We were able to reduce the amount of staff needed on the treatment crews and completed our injection program 2,000 hours faster than in previous years. <clears throat> in summary, we headed into 2020 with a lot of positive things working for us to help reduce the pruning cycle. However, the positive results just mentioned did not happen on their own. Teamwork, resiliency, and problem solving all contributed towards a successful year. As we move uh, towards working on our goals for 2021 and beyond, we can reflect upon a challenging year and bring forward the lessons learned to help achieve successful years into the future. Thank you. Thank you, that's great news, and I'm um, really grateful to the work of forestry and streets to preserve our urban forests. It's such, such an important work, and it's good news that we are close to through with Emerald Ash Borer, if not 100%. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Amy Barrio of the Water Utility uh, about some of our conservation efforts there. Thank you, Mayor. Madison Water Utilities total uh, for pumpage last year is in. That's the total amount of water that Madison Water Utility pumped to homes and businesses across the city in 2020. And that number reveals an amazing change in Madison that's been happening over the last 20 years. Back in 2001, 20 years ago, water use in the city hit an all-time high. Madison Water Utility pumped more than 12 billion gallons of water that year. Today, water use is down more than 28% from 2001. Last year, we pumped 8.7 billion gallons of water, the least since 1966. And it's important to note that we have about 100,000 more people living in Madison than we did back in 1966. This is also the sixth straight year that water use has declined in Madison. There are a lot of things that factor into that decline, more efficient toilets, dishwashers, washing machines, and sprinklers, wetter summers recently, and the loss of some industry in Madison, like Oscar Mayer. We also saw a big dip in demand, or a moderate dip in demand, during the Safer at Home order last spring of about two million gallons a day. What does the decline in water use mean for the city? First, it means a healthier aquifer. That's the sandstone geological formation below our feet that provides all of the city's water. The U.S. Geological Survey has been measuring water levels in the aquifer below the isthmus for many decades. After a period of record drawdown in the 1990s, we are now seeing the highest water levels since the mid-1950s in our aquifer. In the short term, declining water use can also mean increasing water usage rates as the city works to replace aging infrastructure like mains, pumps, reservoirs, and well facilities. Madison Water Utility has also been working hard to encourage conservation through our popular toilet rebate program that saved more than a billion gallons of water since 2009. And in 2014, we launched Wisconsin's first online conservation tool that allows people to track their weekly, daily, even hourly water use online. It might seem counterintuitive for an organization that is completely funded by water rates to encourage people to use less. But we are stewards of this critical resource. The lower the water level in the aquifer, aquifer the more effort it takes to pump it out, the more energy we need. The way we were using water in 2001, that path we were on, was not sustainable. It's up to all of us to protect Madison's water resources. 
So we invite you to learn more about how to conserve by visiting our website, madisonwater.org slash sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. It's great news that we're still on a path for conservation. And um, I signed up for the alerts that uh, the water utility will send you about your water usage. So uh, if you are geeky like me on these things, I recommend that you check out their website. You can um, dig into your own uh, water use uh, at your home or, or office, and uh, you can get alerts when you go over a certain amount of usage uh, on a daily or monthly basis, and uh, just generally find out more about how what you're doing impacts the larger picture uh, of water use here in Madison. So I'm, I'm grateful to the Water Utility for providing those tools to people um, and for continuing to focus on conservation and the protection of our aquifers. Um, all right, so I have a, a number of things to go through today as well, uh, and then we'll get to some questions. Uh, firstly, just want to um, draw your attention to the fact that President Biden has been uh, issuing executive orders uh, in a fast and furious fashion, um, many of which are quite exciting for the city of Madison. Uh, yesterday, uh, we saw a, a whole list of actions on climate, um, which is really welcome, and I'm just delighted that we have um, a partner in the federal government uh, on combating climate change. It's obviously a big priority for us here in Madison, um, and I'm uh, really looking forward to the impact of some of these actions and, and future work uh, that I know the administration will do um, to put us in a better place with respect to climate, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and improving our resilience, uh, which is something that we're focused on here in Madison as well. Um, I do want to remind folks that we have two elections in 2021. I know, I know, we just got through with the November election, um, but democracy is important, and uh, we do have spring elections, mostly for local offices um, here in Madison. Um, we have a spring primary on February 16th, and then we have the spring election on April 6th. Um, in general, you can request absentee ballots for each individual election or for all calendar year elections. Um, and uh, you can do that through the My Vote Wisconsin website or contact the clerk's office uh, for more information. If you have requested an absentee ballot, it should be coming to you soon. And you can return it via one of the following methods. You could drop it in one of our secure drop boxes. Um, those are open. They opened on the 26th. They will open through uh, February 15th for the primary. Um, you could return your absentee ballot by mail to the clerk's office, or you can drop it off in person at the clerk's office. Um, or you can drop it off at an absentee voting site when they open on February 2nd. Or you can drop it off at your polling place on election day. So there are lots of options to get that absentee ballot back to us. Uh, you, of course, also have the option to vote in-person absentee after February 2nd when those sites open, and you can vote on election day at your polling place. All of this information and much more, including the, the two things that I'm about to go into more detail on, is available at cityofmadison.com slash clerk. Um, so uh, just to touch a little bit more on the spring primary, Again, it's February 16th, um, and there are multiple offices that will be on the ballot in February. There is a statewide race for state superintendent of public instruction. Um, in Dane County, uh, Supervisory District 12 has a, a primary. And then in the city of Madison, there are three aldermanic districts that have primaries, District 9, District 16, and District 18. 
Uh, and then the Middleton Cross Plains Area School District has a board member seat that has a primary. So uh, everybody will have the state superintendent of public instruction race on your primary ballot. The rest depend on where you live. Um, you can look up your districts um, via the City of Madison Assessor's Office. So if you uh, search your address in the property lookup page, you will get to see your aldermanic district, your supervisory district, what school district you're in, and then you'll be able to know um, if any of those races will be on your ballot. Um, I want to go into a little more detail on the secure Dropbox question because this has been um, the topic of uh, some, what shall we say, distress in social media. Um, the city of Madison and particularly the clerk's office has been repeatedly attacked uh, for installing secure drop boxes and using them for elections, which let me just say from the outset is ridiculous. Uh, these are completely legal. They're completely secure. They're a safe way to return your ballot. Um, and I'm actually quite proud that our clerk's office uh, has in both installed them and continues to do the work of making elections accessible to as many voters as possible. Um, so as I said previously, our secure ballot drop boxes are open for the February primary. Um, and so if you have an absentee ballot, if you've requested that and that's been sent to you, you can drop it off in a secure drop box. Um, and these uh, drop boxes are at 13 of our fire stations and at Elver Park. So almost every fire station has a drop box, uh, and then there's one at Elver Park as well. And the city clerk has a pretty elaborate process for retrieving these ballots and making sure that they stay secure uh, through when they're counted on election day. Uh, two sworn election officials retrieve the ballots from the drop box. These election officials secure the ballots in a ballot bag with a tamper evidence seal. The seal number is written on the chain of custody form and the election officials complete and sign the chain of custody form and they are affirming um, that they would be subject to all applicable civil or criminal penalties if they failed to comply with state statute. Um, which reads, no person may willfully or negligently fail to deliver after having undertaken to do so official ballots prepared for an election to the proper person or prevent their delivery within the required time or destroy or conceal ballots. So everyone who comes in contact with the ballots has to uh, affirm and swear that they are taking good care of them and delivering them to where they belong. These election uh, officials then deliver the ballots back to the clerk's office. They collect them every day between uh, the 26th and February 14th. Um, on the 15th, the teams will be um, collecting uh, ballots from the drop boxes at 5 p.m. and then they will close and lock the drop boxes. So if you want to use a drop box, you have to do it before February 15th at 5 p.m. Um, they return those ballots all to the clerk's office. Clerk's office staff confirm the information on the chain of custody form, and then those ballots get sorted and delivered to polling places where they are counted on election day. So it's a it's a quite a bit of work, um, but it's absolutely worth it for us to ensure that people have the chance to return their ballots and to vote in every single election in the city of Madison. And again, I'm really grateful and proud of the clerk's office for all of the work that they do um, to make our elections safe, secure, and fair. Uh, all right. So turning back to public health for a minute, uh, I just want to reiterate, um, you know, that, that public health is working hard to vaccinate as many people as possible um, as our supplies of vaccine allow. Um, and to again ask folks to remain patient um, until they are uh, in the group that's eligible for vaccination. Um, and I encourage you to follow this information both at the Wisconsin Department of, of Health Services website and Public Health Madison Dane County website to find out more about the vaccines and about eligibility. Uh, we do know that pending um, 
uh, availability of vaccine starting on March 1st. Uh, we do have new groups that are eligible, including uh, education workers, uh, which includes uh, preschool Head Start K-12 uh, educators and child care workers. Um, and higher education faculty and staff with direct student contact, uh, individuals that are enrolled in Medicaid long-term care programs, and some public-facing essential workers, which includes 911 operators, utility and communications workers, public transit workers, and food supply chain workers. Um, and then some non-frontline healthcare essential personnel as well. Uh, our police and fire personnel um, are currently being vaccinated, uh, as well as people over 65 years uh, of old and older. Um, so again, it, that's a lot of people. So just be patient. Um, we are hoping for increased supply uh, from the state and federal government, um, but there's a lot of people that are currently eligible and are uh, in the process of getting vaccinated. Um, we just ask that people be patient until um, we get to you. Um, and I want to commend public health for the work that they're doing to manage all of this. It's an incredibly complicated process with a lot of players, um, and I know that we are all eager uh, to get vaccinated uh, so we can start to be near each other again um, and uh, sort of get back to opening up multiple uh, public services and other things. In the meantime, though, I do have to remind you, um, until you have gotten both doses of the vaccine, uh, please don't gather with people outside your own household. Um, and if you must, wear a mask and stay at least six feet apart. And if you can do it outside, that's uh, vastly better. Do keep wearing those masks. Do keep washing your hands um, or sanitizing if that's the option available. Um, and obviously, if you are sick or have symptoms, please stay home and get tested. We need to keep taking care of ourselves um, until everybody is vaccinated, or, or at least until we reach a very, very high percentage of folks that are vaccinated in our community to uh, break the chain of transmission. All right, now on something much more cheerful. Um, the, uh, we have a, a grant program um, that is now open, the 2021 grant program to beautify your neighborhoods or build neighborhood capacity. Applications are due March 15th. Um, and so I encourage uh, folks to notice opportunities to beautify your neighborhood, your area, um, or to build capacity uh, in your community. And the planning division is um, running this grant program. The grants are relatively small. Uh, but encourage you to uh, check out the Planning Division's website uh, for more information and to work with your neighbors, your neighborhood association, a, a neighborhood business association, um, to put together a proposal. You can this year, um, which is new, earn up to 10 bonus points for incorporating a COVID-19 recovery initiative in your project proposal. Um, so it's just another opportunity for you to think creatively about our community. There's an optional workshop on February 1st at 6 p.m. Uh, and again on February 15th at 6 p.m. for guidance on how to apply or to hear what other neighborhoods are considering doing. Um, so imagine the possibilities, lots of things that you could be working on in your neighborhood, or maybe you already are, um, and you'd like to get some uh, grant support for that. Um, again, you can uh, look at the uh, Planning Division website, or you can contact Lind Linda Horvath or Angela, Angela Puerta in our Planning Division. Um, phone number 608-267-1131. Um, and so the sky's the limit. I uh, encourage you to, to get creative and come up with interesting ideas there. And then I just want to recognize again, I think you've heard me talk in the past about our Team City Awards. Um, we had a, a, our first award ceremony of 2021 on the 21st, uh, coincidentally, and um, honored a bunch of city employees, uh, which is always just a, a wonderful thing to hear about all the great work that people are doing. So I want to quickly recognize them. Um, we This year, uh, or this month, we did uh, both individual awards and team awards. 
And for the first time, we recognized uh, city employees with at least 35 years of service, uh, which was a really remarkable list of folks. And I want to call out one of those folks in particular, uh, Diane Opert, because she has 50 years of service with the city. So congratulations, Diane, and thank you for all of your dedicated service. The individual Team City Award winners uh, this time around were Carla Garces Red, Emma Gallagher, Cindy Thiessenhusen, Brian Linneberry, Mark Motor, and Tim Troster. And we did teams for the first time as well. And so the teams, just briefly, were the Presidential Recount Project team, the Streetery team, uh, the uh, Alder Response team, the Madison Water Utility Pump Operators, who keep us in clean water, uh, and the Inclusive Workplace APM team, and finally, the First Street Shelter Project team. Um, just want to say a huge thank you to all of those folks um, who are working to make our city a better place. And then finally, as we always do, I'll end with community resources and upcoming meetings. Um, if you are in need of help finding housing um, or if in, you're in danger of losing housing, please call 608-264-0549 or email housinginfo at cityofmadison.com. If you need help connecting to the internet or phone service, call the State Public Service Commission at 608-267-3595. If you need help finding child care, call 608-216-7022. To identify emergency food options or other social services, you can call United Way of Dane County at 211, or you can text your zip code to 898211. And then the city is offering a free financial resource hotline to help you uh, re navigate financial issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. You can access this uh, service at cityofmadison.com slash financial hotline or call 608-315-5151 uh, to get an appointment. These resources and more are posted at cityofmadison.com. Click on the community resources link. Upcoming meetings, today the 28th at 4, we have a golf subcommittee meeting. At 4.30, the housing strategy committee meets. At 5, the police civilian oversight board meets. Also at 5, the ethics board. And at 5, the disability rights commission. And at 5.30, the committee on sweat-free purchases. On Friday the 29th at 9 a.m., the commission of the Madison Metropolitan Sewerage District will meet. On Monday the 1st at 5 p.m., the Transportation Policy and Planning Board meets, and at 5.30, the City County Homeless Issues Committee will meet. And on Tuesday the 2nd at 12.15 p.m., the Building Code, Fire Code, Conveyance Code, and Licensing Board will meet. You might want to just tune in to figure out what they do. And at 4.30 p.m., the Common Council Executive Committee will meet, and at 6.30 p.m., the Common Council will meet. And that is it for this week, so let's go to questions. All right, we have one question for Amy and one for yourself, Mayor. All right, Amy, you wanna come back up? Good morning, Amy. Good morning. Your question is, how much can Madison residents expect their water bills to go up? What are the infrastructure costs? Has this been a bad year for water main breaks? What percentage of water main breaks have been replaced and how much more have to be? I'm not sure if I have the answers to all of those questions specifically. Um, this has been a relatively normal year for water main breaks, um, first off. so. Uh, you know, we continue our water main replacement program at Madison Water Utility. Uh, you may know we've made a significant investment into replacing aging water mains. More than 100 miles have been replaced since 2007, and we're going to keep on doing that. In terms of water rates, um, I touched on that when I talked about conservation, and I think it's significant because when I talk about using the same amount of water that we used back in 1966, and how we have 100,000 more people in Madison, we still have to get water to all those people. When we have a new development, 
we need to get water to that new development. We built water towers on the far west side and the north side recently, so you can continue to provide water and fire protection to all those new homes that are going in those areas. Um, and that is a significant investment. It costs a lot of money, and we have to pay for that. And everything we do is paid in the water portion of your Madison Municipal Services bill. So um, it's a delicate balance, I think, that every utility faces. Um, we want people to conserve. We absolutely cannot continue to use water the way we did 20 years ago. But at the same time, we have to get water to people. We have to be able to protect their homes from fire. So uh, rates will continue to go up periodically as they have been for the past 20 years. 20 years ago, people paid less than $10 a month for water in Madison. Um, now they pay more than $20 a month for water. So um, it's hard to say uh, right now sitting here how much we can expect rates to go up over the next 20 years, but there will be periodic increases. Our job is to make sure that those increases are manageable and affordable for people in the city of Madison. Thank you, Amy. We appreciate it. Um, Mayor, yours is a multiple part question as well. Um, and it says, what about the newly identified uh, site on Zaya Road makes it promising for a men's homeless shelter? What services will be offered at the shelter? How will this benefit those who are unhoused in Madison and the city's shelter system as a whole? Right, so let me give a little context uh, just to start because that question probably comes out of the blue for some folks. Um, the city has been working for months now to find a permanent uh, location for a new men's homeless shelter. Uh, as many of you know, we had uh, shifted folks from the previous shelters in church basements and again, really grateful to those churches for the years and years that they provided shelter space. Um, but we had shifted those at the beginning of the pandemic uh, out to Warner Park, uh, to the community center there. Uh, we recently shifted again to the old fleet facility on First Street, um, and I'm happy to report that I, I think that use of that space is going quite well. Um, it was a massive amount of work uh, for city staff to transform that um, from a fleet facility into a homeless shelter, um, and I'm really grateful again for, for all of that work. Uh, but we know that that space is still still a temporary solution. And so we have been uh, working quickly to find a permanent solution for a new purpose-built men's homeless shelter somewhere in the city. And recently, uh, we did identify a site, uh, and we have an agreement to purchase that site. Uh, it is out on Zaire Road. Um, and uh, if the Common Council agrees on Tuesday, we'll be moving forward with that site. Um, so I, I think it is um, critical for us to have a new purpose-built men's homeless shelter. It's important for us to have more space um, and it's important that it be purpose-built um, so that we're not, you know, sort of sacrificing uh, functionality um, by just sort of going along and um, building in in uh, a haphazard manner. Um, we don't at this point know the full array of services that will be offered out there, but I think that it is everyone's intention um, to create a situation where it's not just a shelter, but rather does offer an array of services to our homeless neighbors um, to support them in uh, their work and efforts to get housed um, or whatever else they might need, whether that's connection to services around mental health uh, or AODA issues um, or uh, employment, uh, or whatever it might be. So I do think that it's our intention to have it not just be a shelter, but rather to include other services as well. Um, and we'll be working uh, very closely with the county um, and with other service providers um, to make that a reality. Uh, but at this point, we're just happy to have identified another property that we think will work quite well for this purpose. Um, and I'm hopeful that the council will agree and that we'll be able to move forward um, with the construction and planning necessary um, to get this site up and running um, so that we can, again, shift from the First Street site um, to a permanent location. 
Thank you, Mayor. That's what we have for today. All right. Well, thank you uh, for the questions and thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, we will be back next week uh, with more updates uh, from other parts of the city. I hope that you all are learning uh, as much as I am as we hear from different departments. And have a great week. We'll see you next time.